Hello, and welcome to the Second Drafts podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. And I'm EJ. And today we're just going to have a little bit of a discussion about uh, video games and uh, kind of have a couple thoughts on why we might uh, think why video games are really kind of bad at storytelling. Uh, most of the time, you know, you see with video games, you're never going to see them really uh, getting uh, any Pulitzer, surprise, uh, Pulitzer prizes there for uh, for the video game stories. So, uh, in general, they don't really focus on the story. And uh, maybe we'll try and go in and talk about why. Uh, maybe we'll start with you there, Ethan. Why do you think maybe video games don't have the best of stories, or if you have any examples of good stories, you can share. Um, okay, well, uh, this is a pretty large uh, field to cover, and I think uh, one would have to be really careful, because you're going to get on the bad side of a lot of fanboys, <laughs> depending on what you say. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, looking at the good first, I think... Uh, I think most people will agree with me. People who've played these games, that uh, the Dragon Age games are pretty good. Mm -hmm. They're usually praised for their storylines, and uh, uh, in particular, the, the Origins game, the first one, which was, you know, that, that had a lot of vivid storytelling in it that I really enjoyed personally. But the strange thing is, the the, the best stories for me in that um, game were told not so much in the main quest line necessarily, which was also pretty good, but most of the best story storytelling happened almost uh, in the background, in the subtext of the game. You know, you had all the extras you could pick up, the notes, the journals, the snippets. You, you, you know, you have this codex that keeps storing all the little notes that you pick up in the world and the books that you open and read. And I must admit, I ha almost had more fun with all the little extras in the backstory. That <laughs> was one of my favorite part of the game. And uh, that kind of told me that the people, you know, they knew what they were doing in how to tell a good game, or how to tell a good story, actually. And, yeah. Uh, yes, I that was pretty good. Mm. Actually, started uh, replaying that there. I have never finished it, and just started uh, going over it again. And, uh, <laughs> and I definitely agree. Like a lot of the a lot of the things, the the real story and background to everything is uh, in those notes and journals and everything that you find that you can kind of read at your leisure if you mm -hmm. do want the uh, main storyline is uh you know the it's kind of a classic uh, tolkien like <laughs> story mm -hmm. there's the ancient evil sort of thing so uh kind of generic in that sense but uh definitely you have those things that can kind of build upon it so yeah yeah exactly and um in the you know along that same vein i think the assassin's creed series also has pretty solid storytelling because it's uh, it's just so multi-layered really you've got this uh, past and present storytelling that happens at the same time you know where you've got your characters in the present and they go into this machine and they kind of relive memories from the past which makes for very interesting uh, interweaving of some of the storylines and uh, you know that's some, always something that impresses me yeah and uh, I I played a, quite a number of them there. I, I kind of lost interest after the third one, but uh, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of twists and turns that the story does take over the time there, uh, especially in the present when you kind of see the things happening and even just uh, some of the things in the past. Like, uh, for those who don't know the series, sorry, but <laughs> uh, when they're talking about the ancestors and, and sometimes even... And the third one, even though I did lose interest, it was kind of interesting when they started you out, you almost thought you were an assassin and you were playing as the good guys who are the assassins, yes. which which is kind of interesting in its own right. But then it turns out that that guy was uh, one of the bad guys. And yeah. so that was kind of interesting. That was a little... fantastic twist. Yeah. And especially was, considering... A... <laughs> I was just going to say, especially considering that that's one of the main characters' ancestors as well. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That was, uh, that was quite a risky move. Uh, and the funny thing is, even right up to the end of the game, I still had some sympathies toward that, uh, that Haytham character. I, I couldn't completely cut off from him, which, you know, I think that's going to happen sometimes when you <laughs> mess around with the audience loyalty like that. 
<laughs> and try to trick them. Well, and even just uh, touching on that as well, there was a game that uh, came out, I think it was not during the most recent one, but the one before that. Uh, it was actually a game for the previous generation's console, so the PlayStation 3, and uh, it was called Assassin's Creed Rogue, and they didn't really advertise it very much, but in that one you do play, I think, as uh, one of the Templars, one of the bad guys, and so you kind of have to set up your areas and try and uh, stop the assassins and everything, and then it shows you kind of both sides of it. Like, I think he starts out as, as an assassin and switches over, and okay. really getting that balance even, uh, kind of almost like what we were talking about with the villains, like showing the other side of it. Mm. It's not yeah, black and white. Interesting. Um, I haven't played that one yet, but I, I definitely should. Yeah, it definitely uh, sounds interesting. I still need to play 4, though. That one, I, you know, the the one that I should have been playing from the beginning about pirates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, actually, I, I was convinced you had played it when you wrote your pirate <laughs> story. So, really, you should play it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely I need to get on that. I have so many games I need to finish, though. So. <laughs> Working on Dragon Age now. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's always a good one to get going with. So, what about you? Some good games that you have as... Uh, examples yeah i don't honestly have too many there's only a few that i felt would really um really made good stories like really top tier uh one of them uh xenoblade chronicles that came out for the uh wii and the uh 3ds there uh it's been a few years since that came out but it's a role-playing game uh okay. very similar to dragon age and uh just the way that it presented the story, uh, I don't think it had anything kind of like the Codex, uh, but when you're going around, you do uh, see these little snippets of the notes and the journals, like, actually in the world, and uh, it kind of presents them on the text. And uh, I just remember thinking that with the different races and the history with that world, uh, some of the side quests will tell you about uh, it just really really gave that backstory and uh, the it brought the different races to life and I just remember always there was this one side quest that you don't really need to do and you go and fight this uh, giant spider creature and one of the things was that it told about how back like thousands of years ago uh, they were this race of giants and they were always uh, fighting these spiders but the spiders won out and so that's why there's no giants in the world anymore and it just was really interesting but it's something that you could even just miss on its own so uh, sometimes the same thing with the codex uh, entries in Dragon Age it's something that you don't necessarily even need to do yourself and you know you're almost missing out a little bit on that but I feel that Xenoblade was one of the only ones that I felt could really translate over to a fantasy book series very easily, just because of how much, how much uh, past uh, world building that they did in it. So that's my one for that. So if you haven't played that, you should definitely check it out. It's pretty cool. Take a look at it. Is it only on Wii? Uh, they have it on the 3DS as well. I'm not sure if you have that, but. <laughs> <laughs> but the 3ds is a really good console i don't know it's uh okay. it's fun fun handheld take a look. <laughs> and the other one um there's two games in this series called uh zero escape and uh, the basic setup of the story is that there's a bunch of people who have been kidnapped and they're trapped in this place and they have to solve puzzles to escape and it's almost kind of like saw-ish so it's it's definitely a mature rated game and lots of people dying and different branching paths and everything uh but it's just also interesting because it's probably the least game type game that you could get and almost that's why probably it made a good story was because it really focused on the story you essentially have these uh, rooms that you have to escape from and those rooms kind of just break up the 
uh, sections of the story when you're going through. So you have story and then you have the escape rooms that you do the actual game part and it's just puzzles and stuff like that. And it's what's called a visual novel. They're... Ah, yes. Like a visual novel, not quite the same as graphic novel, I'm guessing. Yeah, like uh, the the game is called a visual novel. They're more oh, big in the yeah. in, Jap- in Japan there, but uh, yeah. recently they're coming over here. And basically, it's mostly just text, and it's not much of a game really when you think about it. But uh, the stories were really engaging, and uh, especially with the second one, um, just the tension that it builds is really great too. And I constantly was like, you know, looking, I was playing on the little handheld there and looking over my 3DS just to make sure that there was nobody out in my window or anything like that. Just nice. how well it did that, uh, that tension and everything. Okay. It was really, really amazing. It's I really love it. rare, really, in games to be that tense. Yeah, and even like horror games don't, uh, don't generally uh, do that well. I don't deliver so much on that. <laughs> so, uh, one thing that uh, I think you had mentioned there uh, was about some uh, writers actually coming over and doing stories in video games nowadays. Like, they're actually trying to get that talent, which is uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I've, I haven't heard of it happening that often. Um, the one instance of this that sticks out for me was uh, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe, well, <laughs> maybe 10 years ago, on uh, Xbox 360, we had, they had a game called Jericho, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a horror game, it was sh- horror shooter, but it was written by Clive Barker, which is, uh, you know, he's a, a, an established horror writer, so they yeah. really went all out to try to get, you know, to get this guy to write a proper script, and... Uh, I remember finishing the game, and it, it, it was pretty good for, for a game story, you know, so I, th- I think it did pay off. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I haven't, uh, I haven't played that. Yeah. It was a, quite an interesting game. It had a storyline of some evil emerging. It, you know, it was a bit generic, but I mean, what are you going to do? It's, it's, <laughs> for, a, for a game, you, you kind of need to go wide to cover the biggest audience you can. And uh, but it was pretty good. It's like you had four players in your team, and you could switch between them at any time. It was a bit like Norse by Norse West, <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> so it was it was a uh, a horror game, was it? Or yeah, yeah, it was a full on horror game. There was also a shooter, so you were kind of you know fighting these abominations. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah, it was the storyline wasn't half bad to be honest for for a game storyline. It was pretty good. So. <laughs> For a game storyline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looks, it's it's difficult to compare a game storyline to even just to a movie storyline or even to a novel. It's uh, that's something I w- would like to discuss a bit later on because it, it there's a big difference between how you can even weigh up a game storyline against um, something like a novel. Yeah. Well. Uh... Might as well get right into it there uh, with that. Nice segue. We'll get into the, the reasons why maybe we think uh, games don't always have a good story. and uh, Maybe we'll kind of touch on that, the difference between the uh, two formats. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's, let's get into it. <laughs> yeah, well, why not? Um, see, the thing is, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a fundamental difference between what is defined as fun when you're in context of a video game and when you're in, as opposed to when you're in a novel. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, of course, in a novel, people want to engage mentally. They want to read. They want to uh, become maybe stressed or start fearing for the protagonists uh, <laughs> in a novel. Where in a game, you know, people won't sit still long, you know, despite the Japanese visual novels. I don't yeah. think game players will typically sit still very long to be told a story. You know, many game players... Will just you know they are cutscenes. They'll just skip the cutscenes. They don't want to. They don't want to be passive. You can say they 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 want to do something with their fingers on the controller because that's kind of what they're doing there. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, a lot of people don't even consider those uh, visual novels to be games, and the the connection to video games is kind of rather tenuous. It's almost like you, you pretty much just have a novel on the page, it's just with added visuals to kind of help it out, and a lot of people don't consider that to be a game. Uh, it's more akin to, I'd say, um, the Choose Your Own Adventure novels, because especially... <laughs> Especially with Zero Escape, like that has different endings based on different things that you do and choose to do. Yeah, which makes it very interesting. Mm. Um, you know, to be a, a bit less charitable, you might compare it to a picture book, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe not quite. Uh, adult picture book. <laughs> yeah, adult picture book. <laughs> adult but, choose so, your own adventure. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. I used to love those when I was little. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Maybe that's why uh, we like games so much. Yeah, exactly. It was laying the groundwork already. Um, but see, that's what I think is so tough for games developers because they have to strike an incredibly delicate balance between, you know, wanting to tell a good story but knowing that half the cutscenes they're putting so much effort in are going to be skipped by some players anyway. And yeah. the players that do sit through them at least the first time, they are becoming antsy after two minutes of not having action. Yeah. But, I mean, on the other hand, you can't just switch back into action and stay there for extended periods of time because how much of a story can you really tell while a person is jumping around and, you know, killing aliens? <laughs> there's, there's, there's a limit to how you can balance these two things. So, in the end, I think w when they try too much to please both crowds, they always end up kind of pleasing neither side. And maybe that's the problem with game storylines. That's what I think. Yeah, like uh, I think when you look at different uh, game developers, even the mentality of what they're trying to do kind of almost comes into play when they make the types of games that they make. Like if you look at, say, Nintendo, every time that I've seen like Nintendo uh, talk about their philosophy on games, and it's always about creating a fun experience for the player. And making sure that the game is fun, like that's the that's the main focus. And so when you look at things like Mario or Zelda or uh, even their Metroid series, like uh, definitely Zelda and Metroid, they have a little bit more of a story to them. But ultimately, it comes down to the gameplay and whether or not it's fun to actually play. And uh, with Mario, say there's really no story at all. It's like oh, the princess. Got kidnapped again. Have to go okay. save her, and that's that's she, it, really. She really has to learn to lock her doors or something. <laughs> yeah. Man. But the actual so, game itself, though, is uh, is really fun, and and that's almost the ones that stick with you the most. Like, if you ask me about like different uh, the, all the RPGs that I've played over the years, the role playing role playing games, there those are the ones with the biggest stories. But sometimes the the ones that I look nostalgically on are not always those ones. It's more so sometimes the Mario's and yeah, stuff just like that. The button mashes that you had fun with. Yeah. Exactly. Which raises another question. I mean, are we wrong for wanting good storylines in our games? Should we just accept <laughs> the fact that these two things are not really that compatible and, you know, just accept it? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think as. Just in, in general with human beings, we always expect to be pushing the limit a little bit, pushing pushing those boundaries. And, uh, you know, we, we probably haven't reached our, um, oh, what's, what's that movie? <laughs> Rosebud, the Rosebud movie. Our Citizen Kane. Yeah, we haven't reached our Citizen Kane, as it were, that kind of, uh, challenges the genre uh, to have that focus on story. I, I don't think we've even reached that yet, but maybe once as we do, then uh, that will kind of become the new norm uh, for storytelling and in video games hmm. and push the boundaries as it were. Yeah. What an interesting concept. <laughs> maybe it's just because, you know, novel writing has had so many decades or even hundreds of years of, uh, you know, head start on storytelling in games maybe it is that yeah we need we need our uh, shakespeare as it were to uh, <laughs> oh imagine shakespeare for video games that's yeah. gonna make a headline 
<laughs> and yeah, even looking at the movies there, the Citizen Kane came out so long ago, and it's been such a time since then to uh, kind of have the stories and the uh, different emotional impact that they can give for movies. Like uh, when you look at the movies they have these days, I think emotional impact is definitely uh, one of the things that they strive for in those. Whereas in video games, it's you know it really is about the fun and kind of the gameplay side of things. Um, so that kind of brings me to one of my biggest points that I think goes against story play story in games is uh, the budget side of things. They don't always. Uh, put money into story they put the money into the gameplay and stuff like that and even though we have those times where you know Clive Barker worked on that Jericho game that you were talking about uh, I know Orson Scott Card uh, the Ender's Game writer he worked on a video game or several video games I think but that's very rare very few and far between that actually happens so the money isn't really focused on story and that might yeah. be probably part of the problem. Yeah. yeah, I think because, look, for every dollar they spend in the budget towards getting a, an awesome writer, that's one fewer dollar they're spending on getting the newest tech and the best graphics yeah. and the best sound. And, you know, I can't complain because for people like me, I need good graphics. I cannot play <laughs> <laughs> pixel games I just cannot yeah. so yeah I, I, I'll have to be the last one to complain about this <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it might be just as what you're saying there maybe we are just kind of looking in the wrong area and that kind of almost plays into uh, into our personality like we love video games but we also like uh, writing and stories and reading and so we kind of try and expect that from uh, from that uh kind of on a, a, an aside there, I actually almost went into making video games, but the oh, yeah? r the reason why I didn't go into it was because um, of that reason, like the focus was not on story, and I really, that was what I really wanted to do. Like I wouldn't mind of uh, doing the coding side of things if I had to, but um, the focus wasn't really on story. Now with, you know, indie games coming out, there's a lot more that kind of, do try and challenge that um braid i think comes to mind it's another pixel game unfortunately so it's not really <laughs> up your alley yeah. but uh it uh definitely challenges that notion of story like it starts out kind of almost generic uh you know your your woman was kidnapped and you have to get her back but as you go along in the story uh you find out that actually the main character is really the bad guy and like uh, it kind of almost challenges that notion of the damsel in distress like did she actually leave you for this oh. other person oh, fantastic because of uh being too clingy that sort of thing and like it's it's still even open to interpretation but that was made by like one person and it was an indie game it wasn't it wasn't a big budget uh triple a title mm. yeah so we kind of need those people to challenge those storylines. Exactly. Um, just as an aside, did we remember to put spoiler alert on the front of this entire episode? Because <laughs> uh, we should maybe consider it. Just remember maybe to do that later. Um, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. That's there. Yeah, we got it half. Time. We got it almost all the way done. So it'll be fine. It'll <laughs> Better be fine. late than never, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think. As you're saying, I think, uh, especially with the, the indie world exploding like it is nowadays, both in you know books and in games, I think uh, we, we might be getting closer to getting our Shakespeare or video games because uh, there's just so many more people going into that field and working there. And I think, you know, it's like a shotgun, scatter shot. The more people you have working there, the more chance you have for, you know, good things to happen and good things to develop. And I think we're on the right track, at least. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh almost kind of like uh, what's going on with novels nowadays with the Kindle. Like it's, it's so easy to even self-publish a game. It's so easy to self-publish a book and you're going to get more out there. And, uh, you know, some people might disagree. Like the, the good ones are going to hopefully rise to the top and the best ones are going to get up there and people are going to start noticing. 
Um, We're just going to have to trust in the system to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there will be a little bit of a bad segue here, but I think uh, it does. it's worth noting uh, another thing that I thought goes into bad, uh, bad storytelling in games is the pacing side of things. Oh, yeah. And even when I was playing the Dragon Age Origins, um, when you say look at the main storyline, if we kind of judge that based on the same criteria as a book, uh, if they were doing Dragon Age as a book, it'd be all over the place because of all the many side quests that they have to go on and everything like that. <laughs> Whereas that getting back to that main storyline uh, is so few and far between. And uh, really the pacing is up to the player. And that might be a, kind of a detriment to storytelling because um, certain things are not happening at the same time for everyone. So you can't really get that... Uh, that emotional impact because it's not delivered, say, at the same appropriate time that you could get with a video game or with a movie because you're kind of forcing it to happen at a, an appropriate time, almost. Yeah, exactly. I think it's the the player choice that's the problem. With games like Dragon Age, Oblivion, Skyrim, Morrowind, all these games try to give you as much choice as possible. And, well, that's kind of the antithesis to what a novel does, which is kind of guide you down a prearranged path exactly as the uh, novelist or even the filmmaker intended. And, you know, that's always going to collapse. <laughs> There's no way to marry those two concepts, I think. Well, unless we get our, uh, unless we get our Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see you. Here we go. Somebody who can, who can do that, like a, even a group of people who could do that would... Uh, yeah definitely challenge the the status quo as it were and uh fixing those pacing issues uh i think is definitely one of the ways that you need to overcome and to make a good story in a video game yeah. and i that's almost uh kind of why i think visual novels uh pacing is really almost like a book because it's just you're mostly reading so yeah. it's not really a game per se but uh, that's probably why I think it had the best story was just because of that, the pacing that it was able to do above and beyond other video games. So definitely a interesting thing, and I definitely hope that they uh, they figure it out. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just going to have to wait and see. <laughs> So, uh, audience, why don't you uh, let us know what you think about video games, if you do play video games. Hopefully you do. Otherwise, this was probably a very uh, boring or uh, odd, uh, odd-sounding uh, odd podcast. Yeah. Well, in that case, just skip to next week's. Yeah. <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> we'll but yeah, let us... Description. Yeah. <laughs> let us know in the comments uh, what you think about video game stories and... Uh, Thank you for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Uh, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. See you next time. Okay, cheers, guys. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.